Evan and Rolex are obviously two very different companies, though they do have some things in common. And no, this video is not about the Apple Watch. Both Apple and Rolex are the leaders in their respective sectors, both in reputation and desirability by the masses. You're watching Timeheim and today we're going to break down the tactics used by both brands to reach the positions they currently have. Before showing you different examples of new releases by both brands and explaining the similarities, we must first learn what these companies had to do to achieve their reputation, which they can now continue to make use of. Rolex entered the watch business in 1905, which is relatively late compared to other watchmakers competing in the luxury market. They have surpassed companies that back then were leagues above, but as we know now, there was still a lot of room for growth. By popularizing wristwatches for men, they quickly became one of the leaders in that section of the market. Rolex played an important role in inventing the water-resistant case and self-winding movements as we know them today. For the water-resistant case, there were already ideas for how a case back could be screwed down, but Rolex improved on them by having a pattern of ridges on the case back to screw it down with a tool that generated more torque than just by hand. The screw down crown was also improved, though now they had a new problem, which was that winding the watch was a more time consuming task, because the crown had to be first unscrewed. To solve that, Rolex invested in finding a solution to wind the watch automatically. In 1923, John Harwood had invented the first hammer automatic movement, which had a hammer like weight that couldn't travel in a complete circle. In 1931, Rolex improved on this invention by introducing the oscillating rotor, which could rotate freely and was a more elegant solution. Combining these two inventions, Hans Wilsdorf had finally achieved what he wanted for the Oyster Perpetual. Now the watch had to be sold. Simply showing a Rolex watch continuing to keep time submerged in an aquarium without having to do any technical talking got Rolex some attention from the public. They were also early with celebrity endorsements, giving a Rolex to the swimmer Mercedes Gleitze when swimming across the English Channel, showing how capable the watch was at staying sealed during this risky feat. Even though Rolex had brilliant marketing for their new inventions, they did go a bit too hard when it comes to the self-winding movement, claiming that they were the first to invent it, which is why they later had to apologize to John Harwood, the inventor of the hammer automatic movement, with the following statement. Mr. John Harwood of Harrow, Middlesex, was the inventor of the first self-winding wristwatch and we apologize for any injury to his feelings that may have been caused by our advertisement of 4th of December 1955, when the word rotor was emitted. Which I think is a pretty fun apology. Now let's look at Apple. Apple also entered the computing space at a time when there seemed to already be enough players. Just like Rolex, the brand had a start full of innovation. After making their few initial computers, Apple was ready to take on the big players and made the Lisa computer. Even though it didn't sell that well due to a higher price than the competition, it was an important step in making the computer much more user friendly by becoming the first major player to implement the computer mouse as a tool for navigation, apart from the keyboard. Apple still keeps this reputation of being user friendly to this day, especially when it comes to the iPhone and iPad. As if Jobs liked to say, it just works seamlessly, which I, as someone who has been on both the Apple and Android side, have to agree with. Except for when it doesn't. <laughs> with the following examples, you will start seeing a pattern. By sometimes being a bit late to the game, but making sure they perfect the technology, both companies can keep the reputation of making quality products, because when they change something, you can be sure a lot of thought has been put into it. But is this what we as customers always want? Or is it their way to make us pay more for a product that we want to buy anyways, because we see it as an important tool for our everyday life? In 2017, with the launch of the iPhone X, Apple introduced Face ID, their facial recognition technology. But facial recognition was already a feature on many Android phones. Apple marketed Face ID as a breakthrough feature that revolutionized smartphone security highlighting its convenience, accuracy, and the advanced hardware and software integration. While Apple's Face ID is in many ways superior to the facial recognition on other phones, it wasn't a big security improvement over Touch ID. Apple argued that their solution was necessary to make an iPhone with thin borders, but again, the Android competition showed that a fingerprint reader could easily be implemented in the power button or even under the screen. 
Apple still hasn't given up on Touch ID though, as they use it on their iPads and there are some rumors that Apple might bring an under-display Touch ID in the future. With this, I wanted to show you how Apple can get away with solving a problem that has a relatively simple solution in a way that, yes, it's elegant, but it costs more, which is of course passed on to the customers. When the quartz crisis hit Switzerland in the 1970s, after Seiko found a way to cheaply mass-produce accurate quartz watches that outperformed every mechanical Swiss offering, the Swiss watch industry had to start producing quartz watches too, in order to keep up. Even the more luxurious brands like Rolex had to adapt, and with that came the Rolex Oyster Quartz in 1977. Just like Face ID compared to regular facial recognition, this quartz watch is technically superior to any mass-produced quartz. With the success of the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, the luxury watch industry started to move back to mechanical watches. Still, the Oyster Quartz line kept going for over 25 years, until getting completely discontinued in 2004. In the luxury market, overpaying for a quartz watch wasn't a huge issue, because it was still a luxury product made by Rolex. In the last examples, both companies have improved upon what their competition offered. Looking at the names of these examples, we can see an important trick both companies make use of, which is to give their products and inventions unique names that can be directly associated with the brand. In some cases, they make up names for features that already have a standardized name used by other companies. By doing this, they can make it harder to be compared with other brands. A simple example for Apple would be the name Touch ID for the fingerprint sensor. However, I think Apple's ID of the retina display is a much more interesting one. In 2010, the idea behind the name is that the display should have such a high pixel density that the human eye cannot recognize individual pixels from a normal viewing distance. But displays in smartphones and computers have become much sharper since then, so the retina display naming scheme is now just a way of Apple to make their displays seem superior. Like, oh, the new iPhone has a Super Retina XDR OLED display. Oh, so the Samsung phone has a display, but the iPhone has a Retina display. I oh, gotta get that one, yeah, yeah. Rolex is also great at this. Especially in the old days with the naming of the Oyster case and perpetual movement, Rolex stood out from its competition. But they still do it to this day. Rolex managed to create a ton of hype when they unveiled that the Submariner would have a ceramic bezel in 2008 because now it's the big guy who's doing it, which means now it has become relevant and it certainly wasn't before. Rolex's marketing spotlighted the craftsmanship and unique benefits of Cerachrom, which was the name they chose for their ceramic. But having a ceramic bezel wasn't the significant technological advancement that they made it out to be, as other brands had already started to use ceramic for some of their watches. A similar situation for Apple was with their late introduction of wireless charging with the iPhone X. They emphasized the convenience and simplicity of placing the device on a charging pad, which aligns with their vision of a wire-free future. Apple's only slightly unique spin to this whole showcase was their plan to create their own charging pad called AirPower, which would be able to charge your iPhone and Apple Watch. Only problem was that the plans for this product were cancelled. In all these cases, Apple and Rolex effectively positioned their features as revolutionary by focusing on aspects such as integration, user experience, and superior design, even though similar features were present in competing products. Building a solid reputation early on, both brands could use it to market future products that might not be as revolutionary. They don't specifically take credit for new inventions, but rely on the lack of knowledge of the customers about what is already available and position themselves as the leaders. Their marketing strategies create excitement and perceive uniqueness around these features, contributing to their overall success on the market. What's the takeaway from all this? Well, it's not just about who did it first, it's about how you market it. Both Apple and Rolex managed to turn familiar features into exciting must-have innovations through their clever marketing strategies. This video was a bit different from what I've done until now, and I hoped you liked it. And if you did, I would be glad if you could subscribe and like the video, maybe even leave a comment. See you next time, here again on Timeheim.